you'll notice that the gentlemen who were here this morning don't look exactly like the sheriff. He had a, uh, he was in the witness protection program and he had a complete changeover, so he looks like this gentleman here now, right? <laughs> the last minute, being sheriff is like a full-time job, and at the last minute he got called to do something else. So instead, instead of having just the one person we were going to have as sheriff, now we're going to have a whole bunch. And in fact, it's the ones who are actually on the street, the ones who run the program. You're going to learn a lot today. I'm really excited about this, and I'm so excited you all are here. I'm going to ask that we go around the room quickly and introduce ourselves so we know who it is in our community who's interested. And let's start right there, please. Stand up. Stand up quick and say your name, please, and who you represent. My name is Selma Scott, and I'm with Bob Jordan and Deborah's for Kids with Disabilities, and I work at 10 different high schools. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jonna Carlson with Congressman Ted Poe. Albert Anderson, an attorney at Anderson Park. I'm Laurel Byrne with State Rep. Mm -hmm. Patricia Harless. Well, I'm Jane Klein, and I'm with Rome Realty. Olivia Valdez, Harris County Sheriff's Office. Jeremy Morton, Woodforce National Bank. Mm -hmm. Crystal Cardenas, Wood Force National Bank, and on the board of the Spring Climb Chamber. Holly Munsinger, I'm the president of the Spring Climb Chamber of Commerce. First thing, Hard Houston Police Department, and I know what it feels like to be that little stepchild in the mix of all the <laughs> uh, I told someone earlier, I said, I'm going to be like a little fly on the wall. And, uh, you know, with, with all these things. Larry, Larry City, give me about 30 seconds to just kind of update you on a few quick things that are happening on the, the island of the city, known as Willowbrook out there. <laughs> um, a few quick things. Um, I know you guys are passionate about uh, the vagrants, the solicitors, that kind of stuff on the street. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with this that, that issue out there uh, in, in a little bit different ways. We, we've got some some big homeless camps that we've identified in the area. I don't know if you ever go up to the Chevron station out there, 249 in Grants. Yeah. You ever look at? You, you notice that the whole field behind there now is all cleared out. Well, there was maybe 30 campsites back there, mm -hmm. and uh, there was no less than probably 50 folks uh, uh, calling that home. So we're, we're trying to. Uh, uh, change that atmosphere a little bit, you know, per se, working on that. There's another one behind uh, Cutting and Target. You know the Target store right there, Cutting Road and Walmart on the other side? Mm -hmm. And there's a church uh, right back there where there's another big uh, area back there that we're working on right now too as well. That, uh, um, you know, again, we're not trying to be mean, mean old police officers, but uh, just trying to find another place for these folks to, to call home. Because these are the folks that are out there in the streets. They're the ones that are breaking into your properties, breaking into your cars. So. And I'm going to finish that, but I've got one thing I want to tell you guys. You notice what all these guys have in common? They carry guns. They said black. Yeah, they carry guns. <laughs> <laughs> that black uniform, right? Well, guess what? Y'all can distinguish us two in a crowd, right? <laughs> you have hair. <laughs> That's why he's a major, but I'm here. <laughs> anyway, HPD is throwing you a curveball. Over the next 18 months, we're getting rid of all this baby blue. We're going to a uh, very similar color. So now it's really going to be difficult. You're going to see all these black uniforms, and you're going, who is that? You know, our cars are all going to the black and white, ours as far as the city. Uh, again, it's going to be a, you know, it's a transition, so it's not going to happen just like that. But uh, again, this baby blue uniform that you've been accustomed to for years and years and years that we've had for, what, 50 years or so, uh, uh, it's going away. So Constable Hickman, all those old HPD uniforms you got in your closet, they're, uh, they're going to they're go for a good price on eBay, that's what I hear. So. <laughs> anyway, thanks folks, questions, I'll be around. Thank you. All right. Antonio Mayor, Dave Wayne Hooks, Airport Manager. John Tyler, Greenwood Forest, Homeowners Association. I'm Paul Severson, we've lived in Norway since 1972. I'm also on the board of directors for Cypress, for, Chen, for Cypress Creek Christian Church, so that's one of the reasons I want to hear what's going on. Tom Johnson, Greenwood Forest, HOA. Good morning, I'm Janet Ralston with Adults Relating to Kids Parenting Programs, and I'm also a director in my HOA. Yeah, I'm Barnett. I'm new to the area. I'm starting a new service 
business called Parkland Peace, where I release cremated remains for families in state and national parks. And I also have an estate for sale in Southeast Arizona. If anybody knows <laughs> <laughs> I'm Nancy Agafidi. I'm the librarian at the Barbara Library. I'm uh, Craig Klein. I'm with Credexo. We make uh, IT Simplified. Bill Strother, Wine Garden Realty. We own shopping centers up and down 1960. Good morning. My name is Samantha Alonso. I'm a special agent with the Department of Homeland Security. And um, I recently overtook the IMAGE program for the Houston office. And IMAGE stands for the mutual agreement between um, the government and um, employees and employers. So um, I'm going to be um, sticking around after the meeting here. If there's any um, business owners that would like to come and talk to me, I'd be more than happy to schedule an appointment to stop by and explain a little bit more about the image program. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Gail Gallia. I'm a state representative, Debbie Riddle's office. I'm Jane Van Northwood, Northwoods Presbyterian Church. I'm Marcia Kushner, and I'm a school librarian at Houston ISD. Good morning, I'm Jim Wilson. I'm dressed in my business attire. I'm principal of top tier distribution practices. My name is Dennis. I work for Progressive Autosports. I'm the owner of Progressive Autosports. I'm Judy Orson with Big Texas Realty. Robin Trick Set of Heritage Texas Properties. Mike Velotis, CPA. <clears throat> Barbara Velotas, retired Klein <coughs> ISD school nurse and a homeowner here in Greenwood. Uh, Lynn Dozier, retired educator, Greenwood Forest homeowner, member of the Chamber of Commerce and member of the Board of Directors of the Klein Education Foundation. Good morning. I'm Tony Noun. I'm running for state representative for District 150. Good morning. I'm John Trump, retired Harris County Sheriff's Department. Good morning, I'm Tanya Wilson. I represent Cranbrook uh, HOA. Good morning, I'm Tom Reno, and I'm, uh, I represent Champions Terrace HOA. And I was telling my wife this morning, you know, we've been in Houston for 40 years now, so we've seen a lot of change out here. <clears throat> Good morning, I'm Dr. Ken Gould. I'm a homeowner in Huntwick, and I work in the uh, free clinic up in the woodlands uh, on uh, Manor, which is just south of the second overpass, and any of you uh, healthcare individuals who like to volunteer, we'd love to have your services. George Pickens, homeowner here in Greenwood. Haley Millsaps, property manager of Oaks and Wimbledon. I'm representing Shane Ramco Management. Ron Plebo, business consultant. Jerry Hayes, quick copy business center. Sandy Barton, Houston Northwest Chamber. Oh, Elizabeth Jensen, KCS Engineering and Safety. Nikita Sanders, Kill Williams, Realty Professionals. I'm Jason Truitt, I'm a lawyer with the Anderson firm, right across the street. Bill Marins, I'm with Esquite Management, I'm a board member of the newly formed <coughs> Cypress Creek Parkway Property Owners Association. Okay. Excuse me, Ken Sousa, Liquid Capital, we fund small businesses. Rebecca Rex, Rex Association Management, and I'm also a board member of the Greenwood Forest Homeowners Association. Good morning, Al Aranda, uh, Director of Public Safety for the Greens Point District. Mike Baca, Laquita N, 1960 and 45. Gay Garrett, The Village at Glenlock Farms. Adrian Cadena, Frost Bank, Board of Directors, the Houston Northwest Chamber, and Huntwick resident, homeowner. I'm Robert Leday. I'm the uh, manager for Trustmark Bank and new cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie Manessas with the Hilton Garden in Northwest. Mark Havers, uh, new home sales, Long Lake LTD. Crystal Simmons with the Seven Street Mirror. Dean Alton with Linder Learning Land. See you again with Predexo, Windows uh, to IT. Good morning, Joe Patron with the Champions Creek residents as well as on that board along with the uh, Champion Record Village Homeowner Association. Laurie Christensen, Assistant Chief, Harris County Fire Marshal's Office. Uh, Captain Steve Whitten with the Constable's <coughs> Office. Uh, Wendell Bryant with Spring ISD Peace Park. Michael Combest, Lieutenant, Constable's Office. Barbara Thompson, Houston Northwest Chamber. Do you have any announcements to make, Barbara? Yes, sir, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Lieutenant Will Rogers, uh, Sheriff's Office, uh, Patrol District 1. 
Ron Cryer, board member of Spring ISD, board director of Texas Association of School Boards. I'm J.D. Glassman, I'm the captain over Patrol District 5, I also have K-9 and Crown Patrol. Dan Sheila, I'm the fire chief of Champions ESD. And I'm Jason Hernsberger, assistant chief of Champions ESD, and uh, Larry also said I could have about 15 seconds of time. I'd like to welcome you to our facility uh, again. Uh, appreciate the big turnout. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, if, if you guys have been following our Facebook or our website or anything, you know one of our part-time employees was critically injured in the uh, Southwest End Fire in May. He's still in the hospital in critical condition. He's lost his legs. And some of the guys here, along with their colleagues in Houston, are putting together a really large fundraiser this weekend for Bill Dowling uh, and his family. And it's going to be up at Wolfie's on 249. We've got a four-page list of raffle items that range from uh, fire helmets signed by the governor to guns to um, trips out of town and bed and breakfast stays and a whole lot of other things so uh, we'll be selling raffle tickets later this afternoon here as well as at the event I've got flyers here to ask everyone to grab one before you leave it's going to be a, a fun time um, Saturday morning out at Wolfie's so thank you and let's give a round of applause thank you our and those who haven't been introduced, like our legend, <laughs> please tell us who you are. I'm Shirley. Lou Shirley from Shirley Acres, been involved in the chamber and everything forever. She's fabulous. She's and she's only third. Two-time chairman of the board. Two-time chairman of the board. I'm Cindy Cook with Comerica Bank. Thank you. Good morning, Carla Buford with CBN. Good morning, Garrett Weiss with the Trails and Dominion Apartments. Have we missed anybody? I am so excited. Thank you all for coming. So this is something, you know, many of you know I've been involved in law enforcement from a civilian point of view for a lot of years. And one of the biggest questions that has ever come up for all these years is, what is the difference between sheriffs and constables? Why do we have the two departments? Who do I call? You know, a simple answer is call 911, and that's correct. But all of you have your favorites. You know, it's just a matter of maybe they're your deputies and your contract. Maybe they're just friends of yours. They could be all kinds of things. So before we're done today, we want to know why do we have them? Who are they? Who do I call? And how are they organized? All those kinds of things. Please, once we're done hearing from our speakers, I want you to ask the questions. Ask the tough questions. Ask the things you've always wanted to know, because this is your chance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our speakers to introduce themselves, and then you decide who starts. Okay. Um, Jim Sum, the Chief Deputy of the Precinct Four Constable's Office. And I'm Constable Rodney. Good morning. I'm Clint Greenwood. I'm a major at the Harris County Sheriff's Department. Good morning. I'm Steve Marino. I'm in charge of patrol operations for here. Great. Since I've been out here since dirt, I guess I'll start. Uh, you know, I've been out here for 30 plus years, thank you. Uh, and I've, I've been in law enforcement about 42 years, as, as the uh, officer mentioned. I started with HPD in 1971. And, yeah, I'm off to class 50. Wow. Uh, so I've been in the business for a long time. And uh, I migrated from the city to the county back in 1983 and, and have been involved in this community and its growth in, uh, in large part for better than 30 years. And um, many of you have asked some of those same questions. You know, why do we have constables and sheriffs? And uh, it would be nice if the law was very simply defined and there was an agency responsible for doing all those things. But in fact, it, the law is very convoluted, uh, written predominantly by, by lawyers in Austin. And uh, uh, Clint is a, an attorney, formerly with the uh, District Attorney's Office here in Harris County, and also a reserve with our office for many years, and, and a close friend and ally in, in law enforcement. But the law is set up in such a complicated <coughs> manner, it gets complicated for you all. Who's in charge of this, who's in charge of that? Uh, you, many of you have already heard from school district officers who uh, spoke to their responsibilities. That in our region here in Harris County, there are somewhere upwards of 146 different kinds of law enforcement entities, from the federal level all the way down through school district police, uh, you have Port Authority, uh, we've got Beer Police, and Dental Police, and you, know, you name it. The Code of Criminal Procedure sets out who are police officers in Texas. And every legislative session, that list gets a little longer. 
you know, when I signed on, there were 15 or so. It starts off right at the dead top with sheriff's office, and <laughs> their deputies, and right behind that come constables and their deputies. And, and it runs on down through highway patrol, and you know, you got to the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, the beer police, and the cosmetology folks, and the dental uh, investigators, and all of the specialized agencies within this state have some kind of investigative authority. But uh, legislators have identified that counties have unique needs. Uh, every session, and as the legislative representatives here can attest, they tend to test those boundaries and try to force on counties a variety of different responsibilities and, and duties. Law enforcement in unincorporated areas of the county require officers to follow state laws. There are no municipal making ordinance capabilities with county government. Uh, the state has authorized regulations in a couple of areas, but law enforcement falls to those folks in, in the county who are sworn as Texas peace officers. Well, in the, the codes and statutes and regulations that divide up who are police officers, they assign to them specific duties and responsibilities. Local government code, code criminal procedure, uh, penal code, and so forth. Well, uh, county law enforcement officers separated into sheriffs and constables, and each are given a specific duty. Uh, sheriff is the keeper of the corrections facility and has a variety of other responsibilities, keeping up with inmates, inmate commissary, uh, a whole tangle of legal responsibilities. Uh, they likewise have the responsibility, as do we, to take care of the courts, make sure their processes are served, that warrants are executed and, and, uh, and, and, and taken care of. Uh, constables attend, okay, attend is the word they use, which means we, we take the mean take care of our courts, which means as they serve process, you know, we have to deliver that process, and unfortunately that's some of you folks know you've been sued uh, or about to be divorced or a variety of other legal processes we attach things, we attach people, uh, we may uh, be called on to attach a child and deliver that child to the court so they can decide custody, so a variety of legal processes. But above all, beyond all that, those folks who are peace officers have a specific set of responsibilities to enforce criminal law. So any of us who wear a uniform and carry a, a gun and badge have those same responsibilities. So it can be somewhat complicated if you're trying to identify who's responsible for what in the general criminal set of statutes. Speeding, investigative authority, all those things. Anyone who's a peace officer has that authority. And to give you some real history, uh, constables were first identified in Texas in 1823. So we are the oldest form of law enforcement in Texas. Uh, first constables were appointed right down the road on I-10 in Columbus, in what's Colorado <coughs> County, as part of Stephen F. Austin's uh, migration to Texas. So as he colonized the area, they had a, a JP who were called Alcaldes back then, appointed Thomas B. Alley, a young 23-year-old man who served as constable after he was approved and uh, served for four or five years and uh, drowned in the, the uh, Colorado River chasing Indians. So in those days, they were uh, charged with bringing offenders to justice. So they picked up the bad guys and brought them before the judge. Uh, over the years, as Texas began to build their uh, constitution, sheriffs came on 1845, and all of us have been a part of the state constitution ever since. Uh, we've got a variety of responsibilities in uh, dealing with uh, our offices and uh, are charged to care for the public and, and uh, in our public safety responsibilities. Uh, one of the things that Larry mentioned is who do you call? We'll all tell you to call who you need at the moment. If you don't know who you need, you need a uniform at your door, you call 911. Get the, the fastest help you can get. If it's not an emergency, you're in a contract area, you need to talk to an officer, uh, you, most of you have a phone number to call for the sheriff or the constable's office, contact them. Uh, but if you need uh, an officer and you don't care who he is, call 911. That's, that's the obvious way. Um, our offices and our systems are interconnected. In fact, I spent three years at the sheriff's office building the computer system that all of the county uses. We have one integrated and consolidated computer system. So if we take a burglar report, the sheriff's detectives follow up with that report. Homicide, the sheriff's homicide detectives pick that up. So we are in a front end system that integrates the entire county in one unit. Uh, all of us play a support role. Uh, I can imagine being the sheriff being a very awesome responsibility. Tremendous set of headaches, um, an inmate population that would overwhelm most states, let alone counties. So those of us in, in the uh, more rural part of the counties uh, provide a support role. Uh, I have no interest in being sheriff. I run for constable four times. I like my job. <laughs> I don't have to worry about a jail. <laughs> I don't get sued for in-custody deaths all the time. So I, I, I uh, 
have decided I fit well where I'm at. Uh, I've, I've been uh, very privileged to be chosen as the National Council of the Year twice and Texas Council of the Year. And I will say in large part, uh, not just because of me, because I have a great staff of people, uh, Chief Sumner, uh, FBI National Academy graduates, uh, several of the FBI graduates in, in my office, I have uh, dedicated and committed themselves to taking care of this community. All of my guys that are 25 plus years in this community and, and know and uh, understand its needs. Uh, growing as this 1960 area has over the last 30 years has provided a very unique set of challenges. Policing in this area is very challenging. You know, the demonstrative growth we've had, 50 better percent of the growth in this county is in North and Northwest Harris County. Well, that provides significant challenges because along with growth comes crime. And that means that uh, our offices need to respond. Uh, one of the unique things about our configuration is we've always had concern about how you keep from running into each other. You know, we don't want one cop running over another because they're from different agencies. And our systems are so integrated that we can tell when one agency is responding to something and we work together to make sure we don't have those issues. So it, it, it needs to be seamless and transparent to you so that our offices work together successfully and that we go to support one another. So uh, that's kind of how the structure, and uh, with my political and legal disclaimer, I hope I covered most of those things. Mm -hmm. But uh, for those of you who have an interest in, in how that uh, comes about, I, I encourage you to look into your uh, law and, and communicate with your legislators. It's always been a complicated thing. I didn't understand it at the beginning myself, but having worked uh, uh, for a number of years, about a decade and a half with the legislature, uh, I've come to understand how it evolved that way and how uh, our area of law enforcement in this urban area of, of Harris County is served by the check and balance system that we have. We always have the sheriff to fall back on. Likewise, if he needs resources, we have uh, about 335 uh, uniformed officers that step up quite regularly to back up the sheriff's office. So it's been a pleasure to uh, to work with them, and I can count many of these guys on, on my hand as friends. So I will uh, pass that on to uh, the Major. As I said, my name is Clint Greenwood, and the constable is right. I called him boss for 14 years. Uh, I'm one of the last 10 native Houstonians in this area. I was born and raised in Houston, and when I get outside of Harris County, I get a nosebleed. Uh, I grew up in West Houston, Gessner and I-10. I got my bachelor's degree from Rice University, and it was a great degree with, that opened many doors, ancient Chinese history. So I went to law school. <laughs> Having no choice, I went to law school, became a lawyer. I went to the district attorney's office, 83 to 89. Uh, then I was in private practice, and I specialized in representing police officers. Uh, in 2009, I went back to the district attorney's office. I was the uh, division chief of a specialized division called Police Integrity. We investigated uh, police officers' use of force, corruption, things of that nature. And uh, in 2012, um, there was a hostile takeover of the DA's office. And uh, Sheriff Garcia, who, since we're taping this, is the best boss I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Super. 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 Uh, <laughs> I joined Sheriff Garcia as a major. Uh, the initials, I am the major over OIG, which is Office of Inspector General. It's an auditing function of the Sheriff's Department to audit our various operations. IAD, Internal Affairs. And unfortunately, I am now the major over CIB, Criminal Investigations Bureau, which is the Detective Bureau. Now the Sheriff's Department here in Harris County, the first sheriff was appointed in 1837. The Sheriff's Department celebrated its, Harris County Sheriff's Department, celebrated its 175th birthday in 2012. Right now, we have approximately 4,000 members in the Sheriff's Department, of which approximately 2,500 are deputies. Even though Major Marino and I are majors, we're technically, we're deputies. Uh, you're either the constable or you're a deputy. You're either the sheriff or you're a deputy. As the constable said, we have two primary functions. The sheriff of Harris County is the chief law enforcement officer for all of Harris County, 12,000 some odd square miles and over 4 million residents. We also have a very important function, what we call the detentions command. We provide, by statute, we have to house all inmates, detainees for the, sheriff, uh, the county of Harris. That usually is between 100 and 150,000 people a year. 
and the sheriff of Harris County is in charge of feeding them, closing them, housing them, providing medical <coughs> care, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a huge responsibility. <coughs> As the chief law enforcement officer for Harris County and the four million residents here, we have a patrol function. Major Marino is the patrol major. We hope to have 750 uniformed patrol deputies out on the street very soon. Now that's dedicated to patrol. I have approximately 250 deputies from the rank of deputies to captains that are investigators. Uh, we have primary responsibility for investigating homicides in Harris County, burglary and thefts, sexual assaults, kidnappings, uh, auto theft, you name it, vice, narcotics, we have the primary authority. As the constable said, we couldn't function without each other. We have to rely on each agency. Y'all are here in uh, Precinct 4. I live in Precinct 4. Y'all are in a neighborhood named after me, by the way. You know, thank you for naming it after me. Uh, but there's also eight other constable, or seven other constables, other than Constable Hickman. And to be honest, we all have to work together. Constable Hickman's patrol sections, as some of y'all live in the contracts, do a wonderful job. And as he said, he's backed up. If it's a burglary or a homicide or something of that nature, then detectives from the Sheriff's Department, after the initial patrol response is done by C4 or the Sheriff's Department, we would do the follow-up with our detectives, one way or the other. Um, <coughs> the detention command is actually the largest part of the Sheriff's Department personnel-wise just simply because the state and the federal government say for every certain number of inmates you must have one employee supervising it. And then also can you imagine clothing, housing, feeding, providing medical dental care to 150,000 people a year? It's a huge, huge responsibility. Uh, Sheriff Garcia has absolutely dedicated himself to putting more boots on the ground in a patrol function and in light of that uh, he brought Major Marino, who is a veteran of the Houston Police Department, not quite in the same era as Constable Hickman, but he did tell me recently that his first pursuit was on horseback. <laughs> <laughs> now we have cars and radios and what. Uh, as far as the patrol function, I'm going to turn it over to Major Marino because most of the time when you deal with a uniformed county officer, be it a constable's deputy or a sheriff's deputy, it's a patrol function and that person belongs to Major Marino from the Sheriff's Department. If y'all have any questions when they open it up, please don't hesitate. I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, go over our response, our, our tactical response. We, we have our SWAT team that, that you, you talked about, our investigative abilities, but we have our SWAT team, our special response group, which uh, went out uh, yesterday uh, at the courthouse when we had the uh, protest there. They deal with uh, crop control uh, activities. Uh, we also have our canines and our bomb squad, which we, I went out yesterday and had the pleasure of uh, dealing with them. And the MG Bank yesterday, we had a bomb threat. Uh, also, uh, he, he mentioned our special crimes, our narcotics and our, our uh, juvenile and our uh, vice divisions. If you have any questions about patrol, I'm here to answer them. I think they've covered pretty much what the differences are and how we work together. So if, you're, if you have any questions about patrol particularly, I'm here to answer them. Where does helicopter fit in? We are getting our first helicopter. Uh, we have an aviation unit, but it's fixed wing assets right now. The Sheriff's Department also has the responsibility of providing the security for the Port of Houston. And we have a maritime unit, boats going up and down the, the chip channel at all times, but we are in the process of obtaining our first helicopter. The Sheriff's Department in the past did have a helicopter division, but I'm sure you all have read ad nauseum the last few years, the county's budget is always shrinking. We were under a hiring freeze for almost two years, and fortunately, uh, Commissioner's Court has seen fit to loosen the reins a little bit, and both the Constable's Office and the Sheriff's Department is hiring now. But we are in the process of getting our first helicopter. It should be operational by the end of the year. We're leaning heavily on the Houston Police Department's helicopter division. They've maintained it for 40 years, I believe. 
and they are actually providing some of the training, on-the-job training. We have several helicopter pilots, we have several fixed-wing pilots, uh, but that is in the pipeline right now. So hopefully by the end of this year there will be a, a, a bird in the sky with the SO logo on it. Tomball PD, uh, one of our other partners in this area, they have the gyrocopter. Have you all seen that? Uh, it was donated with federal by the federal government and it is a fixed wing aircraft, a rotary wing aircraft. It's a cross between a plane and a helicopter and if you actually go north to uh, Tomball, you'll see this what looks like a kit thing flying up in the air with two guys looking at you. Well, that's Tomball's gyrocopter. Uh, I'd have to defer to Constable Higman. He's a licensed pilot. He knows what he's talking about. I'm grasping for aeronautic flying lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's interesting to see two men up in the air above you, and you can actually see their bottoms. You know, because it is truly a, a, like it looks like a home-built aircraft. Would we see this item at the law enforcement um, event in yeah. the spring? In all probability, yes. Good. I'll be there. Yeah. And if you have your helicopter, it's a good place for having it. As long as I'm not riding in it, I don't mm -hmm. care where it is. <laughs> I just don't want to be near it. <laughs> so when you talk about contracts, for example, all of you compete for contracts among the different HOAs and well, we don't, we don't like to use the word compete. Um, what would you like to call it? <laughs> we, we allow the uh, entity, MUD District, Homeowner Association, whatever it happens to be, to, to select. And in fact, we, we've recently had a meeting. Uh, the predecessor for Major Marino, a longtime major, Ronnie Silvio, and then um, several majors back, going back to, you know, as far back as 1985, we, we've had a, a mutual understanding and actually have had an MOU about how we operate. And you know, we call it poaching. We don't like to go and take from the sheriff's office, or, or we don't want in our areas either. The harmony is the, the chief instrument for our operation. So if, if an entity decides they want one or the other, then we, they ought to be the ones to decide. You know, uh, you know, we work seamlessly together. We have contracts that sit right next door to each other and have been that way for many, many years, decades in fact. And, and that really is a business decision that the entities make. Uh, I have contracts in about 235 different communities that stretch across the 1960 corridor and farther on up to the Woodlands area. And, you know, those folks make those decisions. So I don't need to go take one from the sheriff, you know, just to pick up a contract. So and we like to make that a, a decision that, that the contract will make on their own. Uh, if they have questions, I think both of us are quite willing to answer how we provide that service and let them make that decision on their own. So um, it is a large part of contract business in Harris County, uh, you think about the number of patrol officers on the street. There are about 2,000 deputy patrol officers in Harris County. A thousand of those are provided through contracts. So half of the law enforcement at the street level in Harris County is done through contracts. So that is the uh, communities, the mud districts, and those associations who have committed to a contribution to a portion of the cost for personnel to enhance their own law enforcement. So it is an important program. You all overall Which same term constable frees up the resources. Absolutely, so the incorporated areas that do right. not have contracts. Yeah. If we if we didn't have contracts, can you imagine a thousand deputies trying to cover the entire county? It'd, it'd be impossible. So uh, it's but, pretty tough as it is. Yeah, it's, it's very tough as it is. We're, we're, at, we still haven't fully recovered from the layoffs the year before last. So you can imagine with the volume of calls for service. Uh, between the sheriff and the constables, we're somewhere in the area of a million and a half, two million calls for service a year. In this precinct alone, we're over a quarter of a million calls, just on the constable's office. So you can imagine, if we didn't have the resources we have, and, and if any commissioners or officers are listening, we need more. You know, to be able to keep up with the growth, it, it's impossible. You know, I, I cut a hundred officers here before last and haven't recovered all that yet. So when, the, when the, the entire county is growing and our area is growing rapidly, you can imagine the challenges of maintaining reasonable response time, enough officers to respond to calls and so forth for that kind of area. Yeah, due to the hiring freeze, we're playing catch up now. And uh, if you know anyone for hiring. Constable, can you describe the instances where property owners associations, business associations do contracts with your office? Well, the law permits in, in the local government code to have interlocal agreements with other governmental entities. And that could be a MUD district, management district, uh, 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 
um, Greensport Management District, a uh, good example. They had a, a contract uh, for many years with the Sheriff's Office. And that business entity contracts with a governmental entity to have somebody to provide that service. And that way they contribute to the cost of having prov provide that service for that select geographic area. Much like uh, HOA, civic associations, they identify the geographic area, they contribute to a portion of that cost. Uh, Commissioner's Court has identified 70, 30, 70, 30, 80, 20, and 100 percent contracts. And so whatever that entity is selected based on the Commissioner's Court guidelines, uh, they contribute that portion of the cost to the cost of the salary benefits and expense of the employee being in that geographic area. The upside, as the Major mentioned, is that frees us up a resource to put them somewhere where we don't have coverage. And uh, in this part of the county, uh, we have a little bit of the city of Willowbrook and Kingwood, a couple of small municipalities in Jersey Village, Tomball and Humble, but the rest of this 500 plus square miles out here is unincorporated. That means all of the responsibilities that many of you in a populated area would expect from the city, you have to expect from your, your county law enforcement. So it, it is a, a very challenging uh, responsibility. Uh, Jim Wilson, I've got a question. How do you see technology over the next five years advancing in support of, of what you're trying to do? For example, in the paper today, it talked about technology exists to track cars, move traffic, license plates. I mean, we have a lot of speeders, tailgaters, frequent lane changers, especially on these major arteries who are really dangerous. It's almost anarchy sometimes of the day. Will that technology eventually be available to you? I know it's about cost and resources and affordability, but it would really leverage your 2,000 manpower. Well, we've, we've been involved in, in trying to advance technology. When you have a, a behemoth the size of county law enforcement, you know, when you talk about buying uh, replacement laptops, and we have laptops in our patrol cars. Well, you know, when you talk about uh, changing, you're talking about changing 2,000 units. And in, in some cases where we have to lay hands on everyone, we recently did an enhancement of our law enforcement system in the patrol car. We had to lay hands on 2,000 different devices to update the software, upgrade the capabilities. And you know, we're, we're gradually trying to move forward, but it's not like moving you know, 10 guys and say, okay, all 10 of you guys agree we're all gonna move forward at the same time. We're moving 2,000. And so when you have a, an enhancement, an additional feature or functionality, you've gotta train 2,000 people. That's, that's difficult, but then you take the cost that goes along. Uh, the annual maintenance cost for just that law enforcement system for us is $816,000 a year, just to maintain the software for the patrol cars and that system, so and it, it is expensive. But are we, are we advancing technology? Yes. We, did, we take an hour and a half session to talk about just what I know about the last two years worth of work on technology. But we, are all, we all have GPS in our patrol cars now, so we're, we're getting closer to the point where we can identify where the call is, where the closest car is. And we're busy building business intelligence into those systems to help us do that. Uh, we have uh, predictive analytics that we're working on now. Uh, in fact, we're uh, working on a conference call with a company called Barry Analytics right here in the, in the uh, uh, Woodlands area uh, to look at our data and provide us hotspot information about uh, you know, where crime is occurring. We'd like to go with a more intelligence-led policing approach so that we're not totally reactive. Law enforcement is a reactive group by and large, but we'd like to be a little more proactive in readdressing how that intelligence information uh, sh suggests that we should readdress our patrols. So if we're seeing a, an increase or a spike in a, a kind of crime that we see on this area, maybe we want to move our patrol patterns to, to uh, target that area and force it out. Uh, you, you see it in what we would call common sense crime analysis. We know there's an increase or a spike in uh, robberies of banks on 1960. So our reaction is to naturally have a, our, our regular patrol force spend more time there. Uh, in the 80s, there's they currently were, an initiative going on. Right. right. Yeah, there's a, there was a, in the 80s, there was an initiative called Directed Area Targeting, DART. Uh, it was pioneered in the um, Kansas City area. And, and that has been very effective. You know, most old line cops can tell you, you know, if you have a problem, you flood that area of visibility, it, it drives them somewhere else. Well, you know, much as we love our neighbors to the north, we'd like Woodlands to have this problem. So, <laughs> you know, we, we've been, been uh, responding with what we call little miniature task forces. And, and we have initiatives where we'll shuffle our resources to an area and try to flood it with visibility. Uh, we've done it recently on the other side of 1960 in, in some of these venues We've heard from business owners and folks that 
panhandling and prostitution and drugs just right up on that area of 1960. So we worked with the sheriff's office and, and uh, over a period of time from um, about uh, Kirkendall all the way down to 45, we absolutely flooded that area and it literally drove out the prostitution. And we had complaints from uh, the donut place that people couldn't buy donuts at Shipley Donut without being propositioned or that the panhandlers were kicking out the kiosks and harassing the, the, the patrons at the McDonald's across the street. So, you know, we, we've taken care of that kind of problem, but many of the things that happen are seasonal. So we have to address them with the resources that we have at hand. But technology continues to be one of the biggest challenges. All us guys who've been around a few years, we're, we're trained in physical things, blood splatter and evidence and all those tangible things. Well, you can imagine that today when Susie runs away or little Johnny breaks in your car and steals your iPad out of your car, we have to have a technical advantage to be able to track those things because you've got to have their, their instant messaging and their chats and all the other things from the computer systems and cell phones to get involved in an in-depth investigation. And we weren't trained in those things. We, not, we had not developed those kinds of skill sets. But all of us now have to consider that anytime a crime occurs, does it have a technical aspect? And we've begun developing those skill sets and those young guys who are just absolutely quick on computer technology. And we move those guys into investigative areas that have technical aspects to them. So when a deputy on the street has, has a runaway or a theft or a BMV, we can go check on Craigslist. We look on eBay. We try to find that stolen property. You know, many of the things that we do in the, in the massage industry deal with ads placed on the internet. Back pages, eroticmassage.com, uh, you know, a variety of other places that we'd have to have a technical investigation done to track down. So uh, when we're looking for uh, an identity theft or a fraud uh, that may have not even occurred in this state, we have to have very skilled cybercrime investigators trained to track down through technology those kind of offenders. Thank you, that's a very complete answer. I appreciate it. Sure. <laughs> I'm probably way over for it. Uh, uh, may I, let me okay, also. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Sheriff Garcia, I have to say Constable Hickman has led the way in using technology as an investigative tool. Uh, when Sheriff Garcia took office in 2009, he's one of those computer guys. When he comes to a meeting, he's got an iPad, he's got an iPhone, he's got wireless. He, and so he is pushing the sheriff's department in that direction. He has created, there's some small business cards up there called iWatch. Ms. Valdez is holding one up. He has created an app for your smartphone that you put it on and you can send tips. It goes to a clearinghouse in the sheriff's department and that information is collated, fendled, uh, folded and spindled and sent out to where it can do the most uh, good. It's called iWatch. Uh, we, as the constable said, we recently did an upgrade in our in-house or countywide in-house reporting system, and it was a nightmare at the sheriff's department. We had to take 2,000 vehicles with laptop computers and have them updated, physically updated, one at a time. We had 3,000 desktops that had to be updated one at a time. It was a daunting task, but. The county did it. We got it done. We're operational again. Uh, technology, the legislature is doing a much better job about passing progressive uh, legislation to allow us as law enforcement to use tools. Five years ago, if you kidnapped someone, we drove around looking for you. Now, we go to the district attorney's office and we go live on your phone, even if you've turned it off. We trace your phone and you can use that tool in certain situations that are life-threatening to go live on someone's phone to geographically locate them. Uh, the legislature passed a law allowing us to do that. The district attorney's office has uh, very capable cyber crime prosecutors that are, are able to do that for us and give us that tool in law enforcement. I'm sorry, ma'am. I just wonder what kind of personnel was involved in who got there first but uh, at the uh, bomb threat for the energy bank that was that was the, the sheriff's department in our our bomb uh, bomb team in our k-19 they got there first yeah <coughs> that, that was an interesting case i'm in that neighborhood that's that's all that's close to home i saw sergeant i mean i saw uh, major marino on tv already. doing this as his bomb <laughs> tanks right i, I, I found the bomb stuff i thought the the, the, the best picture of the day yesterday was 
myself, the lieutenant, standing next to a car, and the bomb team was behind the car with their bombs. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I asked the lieutenant, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> what did they do with the bomb bag personnel? They, they went across the street and we closed down the, the whole area closed down the bank. I know them all, they're important to me. They're, they're all safe. Uh, one part of your qu question, in, um, in looking to the future, uh, we have formed a law enforcement technology committee in Harris County and all of the agencies in the county from the fire marshal, constables, DA, all of us are on that committee. So we, we work to try to make sure the county doesn't have to buy you know, 12 different kinds of technology. So if we settle on a, a laptop, they buy that same laptop for everybody. And uh, that's one of the, the things that helps smooth that process along so that we don't have the, uh, the conflicts of all those different approaches to technology. But we are looking for the future. Our committee met yesterday, as a matter of fact, and had a, a company come in that provides a, um, a, we call LPR technology, license plate reader. And they just simply place that reader on the top of the light bar. and. Um, from their approach, our law enforcement officers don't have any interaction. It just picks up the information on the car and they contact the driver and say, hey, your insurance is out and issue them an administrative uh, penalty, I guess. Or, hey, you're driving a stolen car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's there's probably not like that. Not quite. There, there, there's a lot of new technology coming down the pipe, so you know, we're always, always looking forward to the next changes. Introducing iPads uh, is a, a, a question these days. Uh, there's still just a little bit of uh, question on the security for the iOS for iPads, uh, but we're looking uh, to implement iPads on the other side of our business in the civil atmosphere uh, prior to the end of this year. I'm currently piloting a project that will implement iPads for all the civil deputies in Harris County by the end of this year. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk more about your efforts to combat human trafficking and how businesses and communities can assist aside from just reporting suspicious behavior? The district attorney's office recently hired a prosecutor who is in charge of that very topic and that's all this person does and both the constable and myself have met with the district attorney's office and we are trying to have a joint effort. <clears throat> the human trafficking industry obviously is a huge problem nationwide, worldwide. However, at the level that the constable and the sheriff's department deal with it, it's, it's like the end user certificate. And we would have to get cooperation from some of the victims, the prostitutes, the masseuses that are brought in. Uh, we are working towards that. We were just discussing before this, uh, Constable Hickman's uh, massage parlor squad, when they ran an operation. He's not part of it. He's <laughs> totally blameless. Uh, but in, in a raid where they took several people into custody, he needed a Korean, a Thai, a Chinese, a Mandarin Chinese speaker, and just five or six girls. Where do we get those resources? We are trying to do that, but unfortunately, unless the federal government, whose jurisdiction goes outside the lines of Harris County and the state of Texas, can way in and actually make a concerted effort, we're stuck prosecuting the lowest level, arresting and prosecuting the lowest level of that industry. In, in fact, um, it was the community that, that got us into this several years ago. Uh, in 2009, I put together a group of people to deal with just massage parlors. They're a very unique uh, set of the problem. Uh, sheriffs has a vice unit. Uh, that does uh, prostitution things quite often and uh, in order to make an arrest they have to go in undercover somebody's got to get naked and they got to make a case they make a case on one girl <laughs> <laughs> and, i just looked at major marina yeah, so, uh, and i have the exact same problem you, you can see some of my guys would you want to see any of them naked <laughs> so we came up with an approach to deal with the regulatory side and it, as, as the major mentioned, we deal with the, um, the consumer side of the sex trade. And many of these women have probably been in that business for decades. They're in the 30s and 40s. They're not 19, even though they dress up like it. But we wind up with the residual effects of a lifestyle that's gone on for many years. We don't get to see kids or even juveniles, by and large, because they could leave out the front door at any time. They're going to be the ones that are locked in apartments or warehouses or cantinas somewhere that you don't see them. So it'd be by accident, might be a DHS raid, 
might be a variety of other situations where you would encounter that kind of, of uh, sex uh, traffic kind of victim. So we, we don't get into that an awful lot. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to know, I work with a group of uh, students with disabilities, and they're targeting that group of, of students. And I want to know how do they know that these students have learning disabilities, uh, mental illness. I would say probably through uh, internet or other social media contacts that they might have. Uh, I, I wouldn't have a clue how they might be able to target a group of people uh, with a specific disability set that, that weren't posted somewhere. I lost quite a few students to drug trafficking. Well, one, one of the things you have to understand is that sex traffickers are uniquely gifted with manipulative skills. Uh, and you know, many of us have had experiences in dealing with uh, girls um, probably about 10 years ago. My daughter attended a private school right down the street here. And um, two of the girls at the school, while probably in the 13, 14 age range, were uh, contacted by a guy who got to know one of the girls through communication, learned that her father wouldn't allow her to get her ears pierced. And so, well, I'll be happy to take you. And, and began manipulating the young girl. They went and got her ears pierced. He took her and her girlfriend down to a home in southwest Houston and, and raped them. And, and so knowing that they can manipulate children in such an, a, an easy manner, parents have to be on guard to avoid that kind of contact. That's the unfortunate thing is you can't put a child in a bubble 24-7 and, and not know that they're going to be contacted. You've got to protect your children as best you can by instilling in them you know, the confidence to let them know when something wrong is going on. And interestingly enough, on that topic, uh, Sheriff Garcia instituted a unit, we call it the Jail Intelligence Unit. And there are actually people that we send into the jail, and you'd be amazed what inmates talk about. We've got capital murder tips and whatnot. There is a lady who is a former prostitute that heads up a program in the Harris County Jail named Kathy Griffin. That's my stepsister, so I know her very well. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Griffin has a wonderful program in which she, when prostitutes come into the Harris County Jail, and whether it's HPD put them there, the constable's office, the sheriff's office, they are given the opportunity to participate in Miss Griffin's program to get them out of the lifestyle. Uh, lifestyle changes, job opportunities, educational opportunities, drug treatment, et cetera, et cetera. It has been a successful it's been an extremely you like successful my students, so we work together hand in hand. Well, uh, please, we are very appreciative of Ms. Griffin and how she Along manages that. Along too, now, also we're attacking the, 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 the strip joint where a lot of these people, a lot of these women are put to make money for the various people that are, that are keeping them. So we're, we're making strong attacks on these, these, on these uh, strip joints and shut them down, nuisance abatement. Uh, so Dave. the sheriff's department really, really keyed in on, on, on attacking these, these, these houses. So, uh, well, we had a substantial raid on Rankin last month. Shut down Houston Dolls yeah, and Houston 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 Yeah, yeah, th yeah there, there's a, a variety of influences that we think are bad for the community, but we're doing our best with the resources we have to attack those. The uh, um, Offshore Technology Conference was in town here a couple of months ago, and uh, the sheriff and I put together a team of, of uh, deputies and, and uh, put on a, a fairly substantial sting, shall we say. And um, I have uh, some deputies who are uniquely qualified for that kind of activity. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I loaned them to the sheriff, and I hesitate to say it, my girls, but uh, my deputies <laughs> uh, assisted the sheriff's vice office in uh, providing um, that kind of contact, advertised on the um, internet on Craigslist a variety of places and, and shall we say the response was overwhelming and um, I think they had 140 plus We're not only targeting the, the, the we want the job the, the yeah. 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 on Tuesday uh, we ran an operation in East Harris County Cloverly in which uh, male deputies posing as John's customers first went into the area got propositioned by female prostitutes, took them into custody right then and there. And what that was, that was taking the competition away because as soon as the female prostitutes were arrested and taken off the street, we then inserted five female deputies 
posing as prostitutes and then we started arresting Johns, the male solicitors of that. There were 12 arrests in four and a half hours in Cloverleaf, of all places, um, uh, for prostitution. And it's prostitution under Texas law, whether you are the prostitute soliciting someone or you solicit someone to have sex, the John or the prostitute. And in four and a half hours, 12 arrests were made, one felony, 11 misdemeanors in the Cloverleaf area. This was our first operation in a while because of, due to the budgetary constraints we've been operating under, we were not able to staff the vice division uh, with female deputies. Constable Hickman was kind enough to loan us for, for the operation he talked about. Uh, this was their... <coughs> This was their trial run, so to speak, and they were wildly successful even in Cloverleaf. Uh, and we plan on saturating certain areas and with the same type of operation, and we will move around Harris County. But again, we're talking 12,000 square miles, and we have. May I ask another person, is there anything that we can do with the kids? Because these kids deal with mental illness, and because they go to their parents. The sheriffs allow them to do that, so because they live so low economic, they don't have no other way to live, so they give them money for their guards. The sheriff commissioned a study of recently, kids. and when someone is incarcerated in the Harris County Jail, and Ms. Valdez, it's $125 a day to the taxpayers to treat someone with a mental illness in the Harris County Jail. If we can get that person out of the Harris County Jail into a private setting, it's $12 a day. So the sheriff has begun an initiative that we try to determine criminal behavior and criminal behavior that's as a result of mental illnesses. And if it is mental illness generated, we're trying to get them out of the Harris County Jail where it's costing you $125 a day to treat them and put them in a uh, civil setting that we, the taxpayers, aren't paying for. To the diversion program. In fact, uh, the state legislature authorized a $5 million program. You realize that the largest mental health facility in this state is the Harris County Jail. $60 million or so out of, out of your tax dollars go to treat mental health illness in, in this county. But it's you know, it's a Texas was the last in funding. I just come from this right here. They're last in funding. So we did get funding this year. So Texas was the last in funding. Right. Yeah, I, have, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, in, your, in your jurisdiction, what is the number one criminal offense? That's the first question. And the second question is, we have uh, Exxon Mobil coming in and uh, you know, it impact the school district. Uh, what has been your relationship with ExxonMobil and that development that's gonna you know, have a big impact? And uh, you, you're saying you've been short because of cutbacks and we're saying the same thing in the school district. So have you communicated with ExxonMobil and that area that's been developed, those 375 acres, what's the impact? Actually, both, both of our agencies have met with ExxonMobil. I know uh, we've had a long-standing relationship with them because we have uh, contracts in that immediate area. And um, we met um, probably about two weeks apart. Both agencies have gone out and met with ExxonMobil's. We got no uh, Yeah, have a transition team uh, and their, their health and safety group. Um, it, it's a phenomenal facility. You think about well, Obviously, we're moving resources in that area as it comes online. The, the neighborhoods, the, the, you know, the, the various uh, Exxon entities. And as people move into that area, obviously, our patrols in that area are going to increase. Uh, they have their own security uh, plan as well as security staff on site. Uh, there's a 300 child child care facility on site for the 10,000 people who work will work on that facility. They they went live with one of the buildings um, at the beginning of this month, so they will begin staffing that you know, implementation and phased approach. But I mean, it's going to going to be a phenomenal facility. We meet with the budget district uh, this coming. Uh, you know, we got members. And my first question was, uh, what's the number one criminal offense in your jurisdiction? Well, you know, theft. But, yeah, but, but toss up between burglary, motor vehicle, and probably motor vehicle. burglary. You'd have to look at each different. Uh, each let, district. I, want to, I want to talk about just just briefly about the patrol initiative that the sheriff's department sent to me. We're going to we're going to target burglaries, burglaries, and motor vehicles, auto theft, robberies, and narcotics activities. These are serial <coughs> crimes. These these are committed by 
by people that commit these crimes over and over and over. And what we found is they're more, these are the people that are more likely to commit violent crime. So we're going to use, like the, the council was saying, we're going to use crime analysis, proactive uh, initiatives to, to combat these areas in the hot spots where they're occurring. And as a result, we, we expect a reduction in our overall crime. So the, the, the initiative is to attack these, these, these five crimes uh, aggressively with the, the whole uh, weight of the, the sheriff's department involved in this and the constable's office involved in this. And we look to ha have a real reduction in overall crime rate with this plan. Let's cut it for now. Uh, let's see what, Tim, we'll ask the question, go ahead. I was gonna say that when we have a new business move in like Exxon Mobil's headquarters and so on, it is not just the people in Exxon Mobil who come in, but it's the people who come in to wash the windows, uh, mow the lawns, and the other people who require services which may or may not be uh, recognizable in as a, American citizens, let's say, but may be some immigrant group who need additional medical care and need additional social care and places to live and the problems with a, a very low income strata in an area which is a very high income strata <coughs> produces a great problem in disparity because they have children in the system as well as the children which are in. So we have all kinds of problems which we have a, a wonderful new thing going on but then there are other things that's going on in the community which we need to be aware of. Thank you. Interestingly enough, uh, Sheriff Garcia on Monday hosted the mayor and police chief of Monterey, Mexico. And they gave us a presentation and we gave them a presentation. And basically the population of Monterey is a million people, but it swells to over two million during the business day when workers come into Monterey, but at five o'clock they leave. So yes, we have that problem. Uh, it's, it, it's going to be a problem uh, when Exxon does get here. But when I heard those statistics from the mayor and the police chief of Monterey, I just went, wow, <laughs> maybe we're not so bad off after all. Now, the sheriff, ICE, in a partnership with ICE, uh, the representative of Homeland Security, ICE is actually in the Harris County Jail now. And when <clears throat> Constable Hickman, his deputies, bring someone to the Harris County Jail and book them in, ICE is right there and we initiate a procedure to start to find out are they illegal aliens, should they be deported, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that went online almost six months ago. Uh, so it's a big step dealing with that immigrant population that ends up in our jail. ICE is participating in this partnership and it's working very well right now. Let's give this team a hand. The purpose of this meeting, and I think we've accomplished it, is for you to get a feel for two main departments that protect us. But I want you to remember something. First responders have all kinds of uniforms, although now they're becoming the same, because they don't want to have to match everything. Um, we'll be able to blame it on the city before. That. There you go. But when you realize, you know, everybody has their favorites, but remember, first responders are first responders. The fire service, the ISD police, the sheriffs, the constables, the HPD, these are the people that protect us as first responders. It doesn't matter what badge they wear. They're taking the same risk, they go through the very same training to protect us. It's not about what department they're with. They're wonderful people. Let's give all of them a hand. Do any of our legislative people have anything you want to say that relates to this? I mean, Congressman Poe is pursuing similar initiatives to target Johns and human trafficking, so we look forward to continuing to work with um, all of our local and state entities in doing that. And we're happy to help where we can. Thank you. Yeah? Well, I'm just going to say the legislature has last session, the previous session, like not, this, not, not the three this year, uh, did pass uh, or, uh, or pass the uh, ordinance making authority for commissioners court to be able to give them stronger tools to go in and, and uh, uh, have some teeth behind them and, and enforce some of the uh, issues with the uh, massage parlors and, the, and those illicit businesses. And they have done a fabulous job along with the entire community with Commissioner Cagle's office and community ag agitators, <laughs> Larry. <laughs> He's actually an actor. 
wonderful activists we love dearly in our office. Uh, the chambers, all the law enforcement, the county commissioners, county, uh, every, every, every one of the entities went together at the table, have fought hard, and, and really have a great relationship. And we are so thankful for that relationship. And thank you all very much for what you do on the front lines every day. We really appreciate you. And just in addition to that, uh, I just think as a community, we're very blessed, not only the skill level, but really the humility and the teamwork, uh, the coordination, and the proactiveness <coughs> of our law enforcement volunteer firefighters. So I just think we're in a unique area. We should be very thankful. And thank you for your work. And our other heroes are 72 of you this morning that took your time to come here to learn about this. It's important that you care about this. It's a really it's a really big deal, and we thank you so much for your attendance. Make sure that you sign the, um, the, the sign-in sheet so we can continue to spam you with all the new information that's coming out and new meetings that we're having, and I thank you. Have a great day.